All right, Mr. Kraft, whenever you're ready. Will do. I call to order the Westlake City Schools regular board meeting for Monday, May 18th of 2020. Roll call. Kraft? Here. Stoll? Here. Banukin? Here. Lazinski? Here. Pure not. Here. And uh, Todd, uh, will you fly the flag or shall we uh, pledge our own flags? Yep, let me get the flag up here real quick. Bear with me. If you would uh, join me, stand hand over your hearts. I pledge allegiance to the flag. The flag. I the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands. one, one nation, nation under God, God. Indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you, thank you. We say hello to our visitors that are joining us uh, today on our stream and uh, uh, online today. Uh, Westlake City Schools doors remain closed, but learning continues. On behalf of the Westlake City Schools Board of Education, we want you to know that we are very proud of our staff administrators, aides, helpers, volunteers, students, families, moms, dads, brothers, and sisters, all for continuing your education through distance learning. It's not perfect, but it's progress, as Superintendent Dr. Goggin always tells me. It is not what you expected. You're working hard. You're charging forward. At times, you are working through that anxious feeling and some frustration. We are proud of the character that you have shown. We're amazed by your resiliency. To all of you, the Board of Education says thank you, and we're with you. A special shout out, if I may, to our seniors, who I know we celebrated with you uh, through your photos over the weekend, your prom, uh, prom posts, and we'll celebrate with you soon for graduation. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. So moved. Discussion? Roll call. I have Dr. Stoll is the motion and the second made by Ms. Lazinski. Stoll? Yes. Lazinski? Yes. Banukin? Yes. Kraft? Yes. You're not. Yes. Motion carries. We've all had an opportunity to uh, review the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> those opposed say nay. Okay. At this time, we are going to move into the informative reports and recognitions. And we're gonna take this time to introduce our Westlake Educational Foundation Board of Directors. If you would join me. Gonna wait for Mrs. Essig, Mr. Nebraska, Mrs. Beyer. Let's see if Mr. Catan's right. He's going to join us. And I don't see him, but I, I, will, uh, I will begin. Uh, the members of the Westlake Educational Foundation met in pers person recently, and we affirmatively voted to appoint you to the board of directors of the Westlake Educational Foundation and we congratulate you. The Westlake City Schools Boards of Education would like to say a few words about you and then introduce you to the community. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the Westlake Educational Foundation Board of Directors. The Westlake City Schools Board of Education says thank you. Thank you for continuing to be a part of Westlake City Schools where we, as you know, educate for excellence. We empower all students to achieve their educational goals, to direct their lives, and to contribute to society. As we embrace all of you as the board of directors, we embrace you as the board of directors of the Westlake Educational Foundation because we know that you live our mission and our vision. The Westlake Board of Education recognizes the following as the board of directors of the Westlake Educational Foundation. To begin, Mrs. Mary Essig. 
Mrs. Essig's involvement in Westlake City Schools includes years of extensive work in Westlake City Schools PTA, literally one of the most engaged PTAs in the nation. She became a part of PTA when her eldest child entered Dover in 1998. She remained through 2019. She served in various positions, including president of Dover PTA and president of the PTA Council. She is married to Chris. She has four children ages 19 through 26. Mrs. Essig's undergraduate business degree is an MIS from University of Notre Dame. Her MBA is from Case Western Reserve University. She worked for 17 years within various project management areas and the, Incept, uh, the Incentive and Executive Compensation Department of Society Key Corp. Her last position was as Vice President, Executive Compensation. Mrs. Essig is involved in her community in a number of other ways, including those with St. Ladislaw Church in various capacities over the years. And Mrs. Essig serves on the Westlake City Schools Citizens Advisory Committee from 2013 to the present. Thank you, Mrs. Essig. Thank you. This is Ann Beyer. This is Ann Beyer has been a resident of Westlake since 2002. The high quality of education provided by Westlake City Schools was the reason her family chose Westlake. As new parents, she and her husband Richard were impressed with the welcoming atmosphere of mutual respect and collaboration between students, parents, caring teachers and administrators. She became actively involved in the Westlake Council of PTA, serving in various leadership roles, including Dover Elementary PTA President, Westlake High School PTSA, President of the Westlake Council of PTS, uh, PTAs. During that time, she helped establish Operation Medicine Cabinet, now known as the National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. In 2009 through 10, she participated in the Citizens for Westlake Schools team, instrumental in passing the bond issue to build the new Westlake High School and Lee Burnison Middle School. She also participated in the 2020 Vision Committee to develop the 2017 through 2019 strategic plan. Anne and her husband, Richard, have three grown children, Eric, Renata, Krista, all of whom graduated from Westlake schools. They continued their college and professional education and are quite accomplished in their respective careers. Mrs. Beyer graduated from Northwestern University with a BA in economics and the University of Michigan with an MBA in marketing and is a marketing and business development analyst with Bendix Commercial Vehicle Systems in Elyria. Her current community volunteer work focuses on St. Ladislaw Catholic Church in Westlake. Mrs. Beyer says, Westlake schools provided a solid educational background for our children and encouraged them to find their inspiration and to achieve their educational goals. Our kids graduated, focused to direct their lives and to contribute to society. I would like to give back to Westlake community and look forward to serving on the Westlake Educational Foundation. Thank you, Mrs. Beyer. Mr. Craig Katanzright. Mr. Katanzright formed and shared the nonprofit Westlake Athletic Development Foundation in 2012 with the purpose initially for improvements and new artificial turf for the high school athletic field and other Westlake high school sports facilities. He served as the PA announcer for JV football. He served as the PA announcer for girls varsity lacrosse. Mr. Katanzarite is married to Tracy for 24 years. He has three children, Dante and Giovanna, Westlake graduates now attending university, and Gennaro, who attends Westlake High School. Mr. Katanzarite is director of wholesale sales at DeReese Incorporated in Strongsville. He serves the city of Westlake as a current member of the Westlake Board of Zoning Appeals. Thank you, Mr. Katanzarite. You. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul Nebraska. Mr. Nebraska's involvement over the years in Westlake City Schools includes volunteering for many events and activities related to his children, Ryan and Emily. Volunteering for many levy drives, after prom volunteer, band parent volunteer, demon derby volunteer, 
Mr. Nebraska grew up in Connecticut. He graduated from Siena College where he met his wonderful wife, Jennifer. He started his career at Travelers in Connecticut in the 1990s. He transferred to Cleveland in 2001 when presented a promotional opportunity with Travelers. His children, as I mentioned, Ryan, 22, and Emily, 20, both attended Westlake schools. He and Jennifer chose Westlake due to the reputation of the schools here in Westlake. Ryan graduated from the Ohio State University and Emily attends Miami University. Mr. Nebraska's dogs are Savannah and Noah. And he's my neighbor. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ms. Mr. Nebraska is a 30 year travelers veteran. He currently is regional vice president of specialty insurance travelers. His involvement in the community includes volunteering with St. Ladislaw Parish in Westlake, Westlake travel baseball coach, West, uh, Westlake girls softball coach, Westlake soccer coach, Indian guides, and he is a big supporter of Fido's Companion Dog Rescue Foundation in Avon, Ohio, where he got his two dogs, Savannah and Nolan. Thank you, Mr. Nebraska. Again, the Board of Education recognizes you as the Westlake Educational Foundation Board of Directors. We welcome you, we thank you, we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Yay. Welcome aboard, everyone. Does the board, uh, anyone on the board have questions for the board members? Or anything you'd like to share with them? No, as, as somebody who's worked with uh, both Anne and Mary, I'm really excited for this. I just want to say a big thank you to all of you for agreeing to do this because I think it's a pretty important thing and uh, you're all so well qualified. So thank you for agreeing and saying yes to this. I'll, I'll say it's, it is huge. And uh, uh, Mr. Katan's right, you, might have, uh, you won the side bet with me. The IRS took a little bit longer than I thought. <laughs> I am uh, thankful that uh, we finally uh, got this done uh, with all of your help and uh, we're looking forward to moving forward. So thank you all. And at this time, if you choose, you could either stay with us on the call or you're free to, um, uh, to really continue your evening in any way that you choose. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. You bet. At this time, moving uh, through informative reports and recognitions, we're gonna move on to announcements of excellence, the awards. Thank you. Uh, it's this time of year where we, we deal with a lot of uh, ceremonies, uh, both for uh, students and for staff. And today we are going to officially announce our award recipients for the spring 2020 um, excellence in classified service as well as excellence in certified service. So uh, I will get started. Uh, it is my pleasure to recognize Mr. Rich Skaverik as the recipient of the Spring 2020 Excellence in Classified Service Award. Rich is a highly respected member of the staff at Lee Burnison Middle School. Rich as the head custodian is described as a person who takes every task to heart. It doesn't matter if it's keeping the school clean or preparing for events such as assemblies, the spelling bee, PTA meetings, or the Winter Carnival. Rich is invested in every role he plays. What stands out more than Rich's work is his character. Rich is a great employee, but an even better human being. As an example, he joins the principals and guidance staff in welcoming the students to school each day. What's kind of neat is when you walk in as a student to Lee Burnison Middle School, you'll see the school counselors, the school administration, and the head custodian there to, to say good morning to you. He is truly a part of that team and that building. Uh, it is my honor again to recognize Rich Skaverik as the recipient of the Spring 2020 Excellence in Classified Service Award. For the, the recipients of the Spring 2020 Excellence in Certified Service Award is Krista Wattis. Krista is described by her colleagues as a teacher you would want your children to have someday. She's known for her differentiation of her instruction what that means is she's very good at, at adjusting her instruction to meet the needs of her students. This is difficult 
skill that most teachers have, but some truly excel in this practice. She is particularly successful with our students who are learning English as a new language. She co-teaches instruction with our ELL staff and works dilig diligently to reach her students. She also has created a lunch bunch group of students who will eat lunch with her each week to help build relationships as students transition into the new elementary school. She is a strong teacher and an advocate for her students. Once again, it is my pleasure to announce Krista Wattis as the recipient of the Spring 2020 Excellence in Certified Service Award. Now I will say, typically this announcement is much more fun. We kind of like to go to the buildings and surprise them and especially catch uh, the people who nominated them. And it's usually, uh, they usually trick them, not, not as well as uh, PTA does during um, the, the Founders Day, but they usually do trick them in some way um, so that they don't think they're getting it, which seems to be a fun thing to do in Westlake. But um, uh, we weren't able to do that this year, uh, but we are able to recognize them in this board meeting. And uh, congratulations to both Rich and to Krista. Right on. Uh, the board recognizes you. We congratulate you. Thank you for all your wonderful work, Mr. Scavera and Ms. Wattis. Thank you. So this, this next part, letter C in, in 3C, we do have, what I would like to do is, is we, can, we can read their names in, in uh, our retirements in, um, for recognition, but I would like to schedule a time to bring in uh, the principals for each of these buildings. This is another one. This is kind of like your seniors when when you know you feel horrible about not giving them, you know, the the typical commencement ceremony that the traditional commencement ceremony that we hold. And it's the same thing for our retirees. Some of these folks have worked well over 30 years for the Westlake City Schools. And while we will read their names tonight, what we would like to do is schedule something to get all of them in on this uh, Zoom call as well and, and be able to have their principal share a little bit. So for this evening, what I will do is I will, we will just recognize them and then schedule something a little bit in the future. We have uh, Susie Chambers, Karen Herzberger, Joan Jerome, Shirley Crabba, Gay Manella, Kathy McGinney, Liz Mills, Mark Quinlan. Now he's officially not retired until July, uh, but we wanna put him on the list anyway. Diane Reisdorf and Scott Rovniak. Uh, so those, that's the list of our retirees for, for the year uh, 2020. That's uh, quite a list um, that I know has a, a lot of meeting in all of our lives. And uh, we uh, congratulate all of those and we thank them for their service. And we're looking forward to that day when uh, principals come in, we recognize them a little bit more, uh, but uh, <coughs> on your retirement. Yes. Should I just keep going into my report now? Superintendent, absolutely. Sounds good. Uh, really what I wanna to touch on is this is a, a really, really interesting time of the year. Um, we're working on, on uh, three components, which we do every year, this time of year, but it's just a little bit different with as unique as this year and probably how this summer and this fall is going to be. So we're working on concluding this year, planning for the summer and planning for next year. And um, we, we are gonna be wrapping up this year relatively soon. Uh, we are only gonna really assign work in through the, the first week of June, and we are already mid-May. Uh, so we are working on, on wrapping that up currently. Um, as we plan for summer, primary uh, responsibilities that we've had in the past is um, uh, extended school year, which we uh, developed a really good plan for today. Uh, that we'll be able to talk about soon. Um, also Project Link, which we are working on. Uh, we still have some items to work out in there, but one of the fun things, now I don't know if you've, uh, uh, if people who may be watching this on YouTube has have a lot of experience in working with uh, Mike Waters who runs Link, but he's very creative, very funny, just a, a really good uh, a person to have running your program. And what I really like is uh, his theme. He'll create a theme for each summer and his theme this year is No Child Left Inside. And, and, I, and I thought that was really great because one of the things that he wants to do is utilize the outside space in, in uh, Westlake Elementary School, whether it's the extended learning areas that are closed in um, or that giant uh, parking lot that we can do activities in. 
Um, so he has a lot of, he has big plans. Uh, we do need to work it out, um, but uh, just some, we, we laid some preliminary today, so it is too early to kind of talk about, but they are in motion and we are working to get um, uh, uh, both uh, uh, extended school year as well as um, uh, Camp Link going this summer. And then when we get into planning for next year, this is the unique part. And one of the things that the governor has, uh, has gone on record and has been very clear with is he says plan for next year. And, and you know, a lot of people are saying, well, what about this? What about that? You know, we understand that we can come back in one of three forms. We can come back uh, five days a week, full school, as we would traditionally would. We can come back in hybrid, or we can come back virtually. So one of those three or all of those three things can happen. You know, we, we could start off hybrid and then, or start off virtual, have to go hybrid and go into um, uh, a full five day a week. Um, we're not quite sure what that will look like at this point. And however, one of the things that we're working on is taking the virtual part and getting better at it. And, and um, our teachers have worked really hard. Our parents have worked incredibly hard and our students have worked hard and everybody has been really patient with each other. And while we do celebrate the fact that we pulled it off, we also recognize that we could do better. And, and so that's one of the things that we're really focusing on because if we come back just full um, every day, face to face, we know how to do that. You know, that's something that my teachers have been doing for decades. And, and so they're able to come in and do that. The component we wanna do better with is the virtual part to where we're actually targeting areas. So for example, having a virtual presence, creating those initial relationships, because another thing that, that was, a, what was fortunate, you don't wanna see what happened this year ever happen, but we were at least fortunate that it happened fourth quarter where relationships have been established between the teachers and the students. One of the things that we recognize is that students are gonna be trans, tra transitioning to some, to most of the time, all the time, a different grade level, but sometimes a different building. So they're gonna be meet, working with people they didn't know before. So that first introduction is, could potentially be an online introduction. So we need to make sure that we are in a position to create that online presence that makes a connection with students um, and, and also uh, uh, continues that connection throughout the learning. Um, so we are focusing on how we can work to get to that because we also recognize that when we start next year we may have families who choose even if we go open and we open five days a week we may have families who choose not to send their children in so we need to be ready with um, a, a virtual schedule as well for them so we have we have a lot to do so as we conclude this year um, we will finish it off as strong as we possibly can we will plan for the best summer that we can possibly plan for and uh, we will spend this entire summer planning for um, uh, a school year that could be face-to-face, -face, it could be hybrid, it could be virtual, but uh, we will work hard to get there. I had the uh, good fortune to uh, meet with Dr. Goggin this morning and um, <clears throat> it was great to hear about um, all of that planning and all that's going on, collaboration with uh, many, including Mrs. Maxwell, uh, so thanks for all of that, and thanks for the report. Any any questions you may have for uh, for Dr. Guy? All right, if we uh, can, let's uh, move to uh, our treasurer, Mr. Hopkins, with the treasurer's report. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, tonight, I'd like to take the the time of my report and go over the five year forecast, if that's okay, uh, as I am presenting it to the board for uh, your consideration tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to share the screen here and, and uh, put the forecast up here. Um, first and foremost, I fully recognize that these numbers are going to be very small on the screen uh, uh, and certainly on YouTube as well. So I'm going to ask people uh, to go on our board docs website. All of this information is on board docs. We have the five-year forecast in a traditional format. We have it in uh, kind of what the state template looks like when you look it up online. We also have uh, uh, this presentation, uh, as well as our assumptions. And really to understand the forecast, you, you need to take a look at the assumptions as that really has the, the biggest impact on uh, uh, you know, understanding the, the forecast. But um, 
So on, the, on your screen now, you should be seeing the overall five-year forecast. I'm going to skip past that real quick and go into some more of the, de the details. And uh, first and foremost, we look at our revenues, and, and this is specifically our local taxes. Uh, to be very honest with you, we've had a very good year on our collections of uh, local taxes. Specifically, we've seen an increase uh, due to new construction, major renovations, as well as uh, inflationary increases uh, due to our inside millage. Remember, as, as home values to go up, we don't necessarily get more uh, uh, tax revenue uh, on, the, on our full tax amount. We only get it on our inside millage, which is, uh, I believe, 5.8 mils. Um, also, the concerns that we have, though, as we go forward is, you know, collection rate. And, you know, obviously, on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, we don't always collect 100%, and taxes will fall into a delinquent status, uh, meaning they haven't been paid on time. Um, going into fiscal year 21, I have a couple different concerns. Is one, the timing of when money's coming in. Uh, we've already been notified by the county uh, that they're pushing back the uh, advances to us by at least two weeks. So I am worried about the timing as money comes in, but I'm also worried uh, because of that overall collection rate as the, the economy is impacted uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, obviously, I feel that's gonna have an impact uh, on, our, on our tax revenues coming in. Um, I am holding a, a constant 96% collection rate, but I do want to uh, just throw out there some caution because each percentage point is, you know, roughly for, uh, you know, $475,000. So, you know, pretty quickly, just two percentage points, uh, we're down a million dollars in our collections. So, you know, I, I just want to throw some caution there as we look at this, but um, uh, this year was a good year. Next year, uh, I have it down a little bit. Um, as I don't think we'll have those full collections, but we hope to be around that 96 mark. Obviously, higher would be better, but um, you know I am you know cautiously optimistic we can maintain around that number. Mr. Hopkins, yes, sir. Um, you said two weeks. Um, has the uh, county said anything that it could be longer, like a month, maybe two, or no? And and this is specifically just on our advances. Um, right. Remember the, the way that as you pay your taxes in, in, in the community, it goes to the county you, uh, who collects it. The county then distributes it based on typically two advances and then a settlement. Uh, and that happens over several months. So normally on this time of year, we would get an advance maybe in June, but you know, July and August would be our advances. And then uh, September would be our settlement. Uh, the July one, we've already been notified that it is pushed back you know, a, a couple more weeks, I think, into August at this point now, uh, which, you know, normally it would be, you know, the, the middle to late July. Now, I think August 8th is, don't quote me on that, but I believe that's the date that they've put out. I would not be surprised if they push it back a little bit longer. Uh, it depends on when the county is going to open up uh, their offices. Uh, I'm not sure at what level they're working right now, um, and that will have an impact on it. Thank you. Moving into uh, state grants, this is where we, we're having the, the biggest impact uh, um, on, on our forecast. As the board is aware, and in, in, in the community, if you're not aware, uh, Westlake City Schools was uh, given a $1 million cut in state revenue for this fiscal year. So just a, a couple of weeks ago, they announced this uh, cut to uh, public funding, uh, public schools in the state of Ohio, a, a pretty sizable uh, cut of uh, uh, I think it was $300 million to uh, uh, public schools in Ohio this fiscal year, meaning just in May and June. So, so far we had projected around two and a half million dollars in state foundation funds. We get an additional about $900,000 in other state funds that could be transportation reimbursements or, or some other reimbursement programs that they have. But uh, our state funding, our foundation funds has been uh, part of the guarantee program that we get at least uh, that 2.5 million. Well, with the COVID-19 crisis, that, that's changed considerably, and we had a cut of a little over a million dollars. So you're seeing our, our, our decrease from last year of about 3.4 million. This year, we were expecting about that same of 3.4 million or so. I've reduced that down to roughly 2.2 million for this year. And next year, I this is just a projection. Uh, my feeling is that if they were willing to cut um, a million dollars this year, I'm projecting that they may cut up to $1.5 million next year. 
And so again, we only get two and a half million in, in state foundation funds. So this is a very, very sizable uh, uh, cut in percentage wise of state funds. But I am worried about that as we go into next school year. As we get into 2022, uh, that's a new biennium for the state. I'm hoping that we'll be recovered by then. So I do have our uh, foundation back up to that 2.5 million and holding that into 23 and 24. But I am concerned about next year and obviously the impact that it has on us this year with a million dollars being lost. I do wanna point out with only receiving $2.5 uh, million a year, there's 24 payments that we get. So we get about $100,000 a payment um, so far, uh, there are only three payments left. So obviously they can't take a million dollars when they're only giving us 300,000. So we are in the position that they will essentially bill us and we will have to cut a check to the state for roughly 700 uh, plus thousand dollars uh, and send it back. The other line on there is the restricted grants and aid. Uh, this again is money that we uh, apply for with a, a program specifically called catastrophic cost. It's tied to our, our students with special needs. Um, oftentimes it's very expensive to educate uh, some of the, the students. The state has this program that you can put in for costs. So, you know, last year we put in for well over a million dollars in costs. They re reimbursed us $84,000. So it's not a very, you know, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one reimbursement by any means, but uh, we normally get money. Uh, I am worried about this year and next year. Again, as they announced the cuts to state funding, $300 million was in the uh, foundation uh, uh, formula cuts, but we also had another $55 million in quote unquote other educational expenses. So I'm not sure what that exactly means. So to be a little conservative, uh, while we have applied for some of that reimbursement for this year, I'm not sure they're going to fund it. So I do have that down to zero uh, for, uh, for this year. The other piece I wanna point out is uh, we've heard a lot in the news about the CARES Act from the federal funding. Ohio received $300 million in federal funds uh, for, uh, from the CARES Act, uh, the Coronavirus uh, uh, Relief Act. And uh, Westlake Schools is uh, uh, gonna receive approximately $275,000. It's a little higher than that uh, with uh, somewhere around 340, but we lose over $60,000 that we have to distribute to private schools within Westlake. Uh, it just passes through us. So what we'll actually be able to use for our students is about $275,000. That's not reflected in the forecast. And the reason for that is because it is federal funds. It's put in a separate restricted account I believe they're using the 507 or 508 fund number. Um, our, our forecast is built solely off of our general fund. So those are other uh, restricted funds that we have to apply to get reimbursed for. Uh, but we do have some money coming in from the federal government, but it certainly does not offset the cut that we're facing um, uh, with the state funds. We have other revenue as well. So we had state, re you know, local revenue, we have state revenue, and then we have other revenue. And the other revenue is, is made up in a, in a number of different ways. It could be part of income tax sharing agreements or a, a TIF agreement that we have, a tax incentive uh, increment financing agreement that we have uh, in Crocker Park. We also do some payment in lieu of tax agreements when people have challenged uh, their property values. Uh, we'll often do a settlement uh, that has some payments. We have some tuition payments come in and we have interest income. This year was a little bit higher. We did well on interest. We had uh, well over $600,000 that we received in, in interest income this year, or at least so far through the end of April. We, um, uh, we also had some uh, new pilot agreements as there was the update last year. So the process of working through uh, the uh, tax value uh, challenges, uh, we had some of those pilot agreements. So that has added to it to where we had a increase of, uh, and, and I've moved it up to about $2.1 million in other revenue. But I do see some of that you know, uh, losing next year, dropping off next year, uh, specifically in interest. As we know right now, interest rates are, are have, you know, dropped considerably from where they were. Uh, as a school district, we, we were not able to generate a whole lot of interest to begin with, as uh, we are very, very conservative and rightfully so because it is taxpayer funds on where we can invest our money. But, um, you know, with it dropping even farther and, and uh, uh, even some, you know, uh, talk of dropping down to a zero or in a negative rate, and we know the federal funds rate is somewhere around a quarter or less. Um, I feel that our interest rates are going to drop, you know, considerably and our interest income will drop considerably. 
Uh, also, there are some just uncertainties with those other revenues, with whether it's the pilot agreements or tuition. I'm just not sure how to forecast that right now. So I am showing a decrease uh, going into next year and maintaining that through the forecast right now. Mr. Hopkins, uh, yes, the, the interest income, can you remind us where that interest income came from? Uh, I, I think about some of your um, creativeness uh, in particular during the construction project was, was some of that uh, resulting from that? So uh, no, what we were, we were trying to work very hard to maintain all of the interest that we could into the construction project, uh, both in obviously if it's generated in that fund, it has to stay in that fund, but also right. by using the general fund to uh, uh, kind of as a temporary expenditures. And then we would apply for reimbursements later. Uh, you know, this year we've just seen interest rates, uh, you know, creep up uh, uh, to our benefit. We work with uh, Red Tree Investments out of Cincinnati who invests our funds for us. Um, and so we've been able to do some more, uh, some commercial paper has paid uh, well. Uh, and we've done a little bit better than Star Ohio. We also invest in Star Ohio uh, for some of our returns. So we are trying to be creative with it, but uh, uh, certainly well within the law still. Thank you. All right, so as we look then moving on to our expenditures, our expenditure side, uh, you know, this year we saw a slight decrease. We were projecting somewhere around uh, uh, $30.8 million in expenditures uh, for personnel services. Uh, you know, we're projecting it now at about uh, a 30.6. Uh, the honest reason for that is there's been no overtime or extra, uh, extra time as the uh, COVID-19 has uh, cause our schools to close. So the opportunity for our staff, specifically the classified staff, uh, has been greatly reduced. Um, you know, so we have seen a, a decrease in, in that uh, cost there, as well as um, our on our benefit side, I generally project a 12% increase. I know that might be a little high some years, uh, but I've also uh, in my career have seen some increases that have been higher than that. Uh, this year, they, it was low. We had a good year last year. Um, so the increase that went into effect in October was only about a 4% increase. So we saw a significant, uh, uh, you know, or a, well, a significant cost avoidance that we were planning on uh, for our, our benefits. Now, I'll be honest, you know, with this year and the, the, the uh, issues that we're going through as a society right now, globally right now, uh, I am worried about what health care costs will look like for the increase uh, as we go into next school year. Uh, we Again, we get notified uh, usually in September, late August, September, what the new rates will be in uh, effective uh, October 1st. So I am concerned about that. But um, you'll see our spending on the slide there where we typically have, we are showing salary growth of 4% uh, uh, for next year due to some contractual obligations. And then I'm showing 3% for uh, 22, 23, and 24. Um, and then, you know, we all of this, if, if you look at it, we've had seen very, very small incremental increases each year in our personnel services from 2017 to 18 to 19 and even in 2020. And the reason for that is because the community had passed the bond issue to build the new elementary school, we've been able to consolidate the four elementaries and see an overall savings that we've documented at well over $1.6 million. While you don't see a, a dramatic drop of 1.6 million in, in the uh, salary piece or on the forecast, it's done incrementally as we've not replaced positions, uh, but we've still have you know other costs of, of raises or increases uh, uh, built into that. So I just want to make sure that that you know we do stress that we did see that that was an actual savings. We've documented that savings, and we're appreciative to the community that have allowed us to do that savings. Purchase services. Um, we have uh, um, a, a lot of purchasing that, that goes on. This can be utilities. This can be our substitute teachers. This can be uh, uh, technology uh, uh, licenses uh, and services out of district tuition. This is kind of a, a catch all of services that are provided uh, to the district. Uh, also on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see that it also is where we pay for community schools where we have deductions from our state funding for community schools or open enrollment or our scholarship deductions. The scholarships are the autism scholarship and the John Peterson scholarship, which is for uh, students with special needs who choose to uh, go to a private school. So you know, we've seen some uh, reductions this year in our community school and open enrollment, but we've seen an increase uh, in our scholarship deduction deductions. It really is almost a, a net even between the, the two there. We did see a, a savings this year in substitute teachers because again, the closure starting uh, approximately at March 15th 
uh, we haven't needed substitute teachers for the, the remainder of the year. That's about $100,000 savings uh, that we've actually uh, taken in. But um, we are, I do project that uh, 6.8 million to come down as we're working right now to close out purchase orders that currently open. But worst case scenario, it would be right around that $6.8 million. We have supplies and equipment. Um, again, this is some of the smaller numbers where we have uh, this, where we purchase instructional supplies, uh, office supplies, uh, technology supplies, and, and so on. Uh, you'll see a reduction uh, uh, this year. Again, we stopped all purchasing roughly on, on March 15th. Normally we'd be ramping up purchasing uh, for the upcoming school year. That isn't happening right now as we're taking a more cautious approach and figuring out what our needs are for, for next school year. So I do see it jumping back up both for some of our instructional supplies, but also to be honest, we're gonna have an increase in our costs of cleaning supplies and equipment. Um, we're seeing that already as some of those uh, supplies of increasing costs. Um, as well as if we're uh, if we are in a five day uh, school environment, our uh, routines are going to increase uh, significantly for uh, making sure we're providing a safe and, and uh, a sanitized environment for our students. So ultimately, what it all comes down to is we are showing a, a small uh, deficit spending this year of uh, four to five hundred thousand dollars as we drop down a little bit, um, and then next year worries me. And next year worries me specifically because of the uncertainty with the state funding and our collection rates. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we would not see as big of a deficit spend next year as I'm projecting. I try to be conservative in my, my projections, but I am concerned on how that will work out uh, next year and what our deficit spending will be. Um, ideally, the black line on there is we'd like to have at least three months of expenses uh, cash on hand as we have, you know, uh, bills that are constantly being paid, uh, uh, salaries and benefits constantly being paid, it becomes a cash flow issue. Uh, and there's potential next year that we could drop below that. Um, and certainly, you know, right now projecting at 2022. So as we have conversations moving forward about uh, levies um, or, or, or some other uh, uh, expenses or reduction of expen uh, expenses, we wanna make sure that we're monitoring where our funds are, uh, where our balances are, and uh, how we're moving forward to maintain the cash balance that we need in order to operate the district. Um, you know, I do have, it's not all negative. While, um, you know, we do have that uncertainty and that's certainly negative, um, the, we, we do have some positives this year. We are positioned well to weather the storm. Uh, and I give credit to Dr. Gog and the Board of Education and the administrative team. Uh, we've positioned the, the district to have a, a significant cash balance. So even the hit of a million dollars from the state, while it's certainly upsetting to me and concerning to me, uh, it is not having a massive impact on, uh, on us to where we're responding by cutting uh, uh, programs, educational programs for our students. So we're positioned well to weather this storm, but we do need to monitor it closely and make sure that we react to it uh, as we go into next school year uh, and beyond. So that's really my presentation on the uh, forecast. I'm happy to answer any questions that the board may have regarding it. Any questions for Treasurer Hopkins? Have, have you already had your finance committee meeting? We did. Any thoughts on that? Well, I was gonna ask if you, uh, this, if we're supposed to be talking, but I was going to ask if you um, discussed uh, the levy at all for the fall. We, we did have some conversations with regard to uh, the levy in the fall. And uh, our conclusion was at this point, uh, we'd like to continue to consider it. And um, that, that's where we left the, the meeting. Do you have any there, further? Seemed be, there seemed to be a lot of still unknowns associated with the economy, um, with even people starting going back to work and the economy opening up that uh, Mr. Hopkins said, we, we have a little bit of time, I think, uh, probably at least to early July so that we can see what exactly is going on in the economy, unemployment, and take into consideration all the different factors associated with that. So we're keeping an eye on it, but I don't think we would probably make a, uh, a recommendation or even a, a deeper conversation 
until maybe the end of June, uh, early July, which would give us enough time to still uh, do what we need required wise to be able to get on the ballot. So. Okay. It's interesting just to see in the financial markets and you, you, uh, we know that the stock market is a forward indicator of uh, what may happen ahead. And of course the stock market's predicting this V shaped curve, which we had a lot of interesting debate about that uh, even in the, uh, in the finance meeting. Uh, but as Mr. Finucane suggested, a lot of unknowns out there. Uh, again, it's something that we want to take our constituents into consideration and um, what, what uh, they may be going through, of course, uh, the district and doing what's best for the district, um, but taking into consideration all opinions and just uh, continue to talk about it. Any other board members have any thoughts? I'm very concerned about a fall levy and what's gonna, what one, the school year is gonna look like in August, also what the school year is gonna look like in November. And also the overall feeling of what the current situation. So while I do realize we do need to go for a levy soon, especially looking at our cash reserves and where we're at, um, I think it's knowing how the community is hurting. I think it's, you know, not saying make decisions now, like we can wait until June, July uh, before making final decisions. But I think we need to really, you know, pay attention to what's going on with the community and sort of the sentiment and the feeling, because there's a lot of people who are concerned, who have been laid off, who have not heard yet if they're going back to work. So. Yeah, I concur with, with Liz. I think it's a probably in, you know, where we are today, and it's hard to say where we'll be, in, you know, a couple months, um, we're probably not ready. And also, if you think of some of those uh, seminars that we've attended down when we go to Columbus at the Ohio School Board, um, you know, they say that we need, you know, at least eight to 10 months, I believe that was the timing. And if we wait till July, you know, we don't have a lot of time before the November ballot to, to get everything ready. I just don't want to get ourselves in an emergency situation where, you know, it's panic and we, we have to pass something uh, uh, right away. And sentiment, I think, is pretty good now for the schools. And, uh, but, but I agree, I think we wait until July to see where things are going. But as I told Joe, uh, Ed and I were talking about it and he says, well, it won't pass if it's not on the ballot here, but. Understood, understood. I know uh, Dr. Geigen mentioned that uh, we, we have um, a lot of uh, work uh, to do still this school year. We're going to meet uh, a number of times. We have uh, graduates to, um, uh, to approve and uh, obviously business to carry out. Uh, keep those thoughts in mind and um, let's bring those thoughts to the table and uh, see where that brings us. Any other thoughts, questions, comments for our treasurer, Mr. Hopkins? I have a question I want to follow up on, um, Mr. Hopkins, and I, I had reached out to you about this, and I had somebody else reach out to me today about refunds on field trips through the school. I'm not talking about the uh, music trip or a DC trip, but where um, I think it was first and fourth grade had paid prepaid for some field trips. Yeah, I'm fully prepared to uh, make refunds on all of our, our field trips, any of the money that we collected on it. Um, I've been working with the uh, principals and secretarial staff. Again, we're trying to collect all the information and do one check. So okay. we have people coming in uh, asking for refunds on lunch accounts or uh, school accounts. Um, you know, we're just trying to consolidate all those. So uh, I was speaking with one of our uh, secretaries, uh, Evelyn at the high school uh, yesterday. Um, actually, I, I take that back. I think it was uh, uh, Thursday last week, but uh, she's been very good starting a spreadsheet on all of those refunds so that we can then apply it and just do it through one, uh, one check run or, or a couple check runs instead of doing them incrementally as, as they come in. 
totally understand. Somehow, personally, we ended up only with 47 cents in our daughter's lunch account, and it was not planned that way. So, but I've had a number of parents reach out about the field trip. So, thank you. Anything else for Treasurer Hopkins? If Mr. not, I'm happy to go into my recommendations. All right. So uh, the first one is uh, asking the board to approve uh, the five-year forecast. I think that's, we've already gone over that in detail. Uh, the second uh, 4B on the agenda tonight is uh, a resolution to fix, accept, and approve uh, the CFO treasurer's bond. Under Ohio revised code, I'm uh, required to be bonded uh, under our board policy as well. I'm required to be bonded. Um, typically the bond follows uh, your, my contract. Uh, so actually on, on this bond, it was a five-year bond that started a year before I came in. When the board hired me, uh, we were able to roll that bond over to uh, from uh, Mr. Prepare to myself. Uh, now with my contract ending here at the end of July and a new one starting in August, I am asking the board to allow me to enter into another bond. Uh, the details are listed in the resolution. And um, uh, if so, uh, if the board approves, I'll move forward with uh, getting that uh, and a copy of that to the board. Um, I also have a C on there, a 4C, a resolution designating depositories of public monies uh, in the Westlake City School District. Um, if you remember a, a few months ago, we've gone through a, uh, every five years we're required to do an RFP for banking services. We started this process a few months ago and we're uh, again looking at, uh, we, we did the RFP, received back the responses. Uh, we received responses from four uh, local banks uh, from the RFP. I'm asking the board to approve uh, both Huntington National Bank and Dollar Bank, which have already both been approved in the past for the board, so uh, by the board. So we'd be continuing the relationship with those two banks. We also have uh, Treasurer 4D, which is a, a, a resolution issued then and now uh, certifications. You'll see we have the city of Westlake, the bulk salt that we uh, get from the uh, from the city to salt our parking lots during the wintertime. We're always billed after the fact. That's why it's a then and now. Uh, the rest of them on there, the other four are all from the non-public schools that run auxiliary services money through the district. So uh, they're not our expenses directly. And uh, that's all of them that I have on for the board tonight. So if the board so chooses, I'm happy to have all four of them combined. Is there a motion to approve treasurer's recommendations 4A through D? So moved. Second. Discussion. So the city charged us $4,800 for 75 tons of salt. Yeah, so this is the, the salt that we go and pick up with our trucks okay. uh, at the city salt bin. Um, so yeah. it's actually, we're appreciative to be able to get it from the city. Uh, instead of trying to get it from a third party somewhere okay. else. Well, we didn't use all that this year, though, did we? I mean, it wasn't a bad winter. We didn't have, or did we? Oh, we we did. This is, this is we, we were built for exactly what we used. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. And, it, and you're right. It wasn't a bad winter, but we still, when it's, when it's the conditions are right, we still have to salt as a preventative piece. We don't sure. want people to slip on our, on our drive, uh, sidewalks right. and driveways. So we do uh, go through and salt it. Further discussion? Roll call. Fanukin. You're on mute. You're muted. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Lazinski? Yes. Kraft? Yes. Piernot? Yes. Stoll? Yes. Motion carries. We'll move on to superintendent's recommendations, Dr. Geiger. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have some recommendations tonight. Uh, the first one, uh, 5A, is a resolution to approve administrative employment. Uh, for Amanda Musselman, she has been employee of the Westlake City Schools, uh, but we have had um, a resignation. Uh, Mr. Alex Fleming, who has been with us for the past four years as our DIS principal, director of academic for grades K to six, and most recently, he even stepped up and, and filled in uh, as our HR director. Um, he did uh, start a business outside of school. And fortunately for him, it's going very well. And he is going to commit full time to that business. So therefore, looking at uh, Amanda Musselman to bring her up and replace Alex Fleming. Letter B 
is a resolution to approve a stipend for Westlake Elementary School lead administrator. This We've talked about this previously, um, but uh, did not put it on the agenda. We've had uh, Beth D'Agostino take on a more significant role in the elementary school, um, really taking on master scheduling and a lot of the, a lot of really the logistical part of um, that building. And uh, we did tell her that if she did that, she would uh, get an increased stipend for that. Letter C is a resolution to approve salary increases. These are increases due to uh, um, uh, increase in education. Letter D is a resolution to approve first year continuing and limited contracts. <clears throat> okay, so this one, some of these folks that these are these are pretty standard. And and the difference that we have here is we would typically have more continuing contracts than the two. We actually had seven teachers who were eligible this year, but in order for us to approve them in a continuing contract, they have to complete their evaluation cycle. And obviously, and, and, and we're, we have a memorandum of understanding that is letter H, one of those components inside the memorandum of understanding is that if a teacher did not complete, is, is up for a continuing contract and did not complete their um, evaluation cycle this year, they would get a limited contract for next year. So six of the, or I'm sorry, five of the, fo five of the folks inside here are those who would have been typically eligible for a continuing contract, but they'll be eligible next year. So that's what letter D is. Um, next one is resolution to approve, approve a performance contract. We were gonna have this on the last agenda, but we pulled it off. You know, because we noticed that the, the dates on here were January 21st through April 6th. And obviously with the closing on March 13th, then that didn't fully happen. We didn't, you know, she did not fulfill the entire contract. And this is 75% of that contract. So uh, it would, would have been 75% higher, but due to the fact that she didn't finish all the way through, uh, it's been reduced to, to this particular um, amount. In letter F, um, uh, a resolution to amend 2049. Um, and then what this says that the Re Board, State Board of Education amends 2049 to reflect a 20 reduction of 25% in the paid rate to Westlake Volleyball Academy coaches, directors due to the coronavirus pandemic shortened season. Um, so obviously there was something uh, that we had passed before that was for a different amount, but due to the shutdown, uh, it's been reduced 25% as well. This is a resolution to approve the 2020 and 2021 handbooks. And uh, when we kind of put these, uh, when we vote on these, we still have Kathy Maxwell on the line. So if you do have more questions on these handbooks, um, we can ask them with her. And then this is the uh, resolution to approve a memorandum of understanding with uh, our Westlake Teacher Association. Um, you know, last week was Staff Appreciation Week, and, and uh, we do talk a lot about how we appreciate our staff, and, and it's not only for the performance with our students, um, you know, but led by uh, Patrick McMorrow, um, our, our teacher association, as well as our OPSI, but, but looking at our teacher association specifically with this MOU, uh, being able to sit down with them and go through a very, very complex document and, and really amend much of our contract or, or some significant parts to our contract to adapt to a distance learning um, environment to be able to do that um, as, as I wouldn't say it effortlessly, but as, as well as we did, um, is just a testament to his leadership uh, as well as the dedication of our teachers. And, and in looking at this MOU, when you do go through it, you'll see there are a lot of things listed in there. It, it, it was not only creating this, um, had a lot of conversations, but even what they went to to take their vote. Uh, they did a drive-through vote where Patrick stood there for a certain amount of time and people would just drive by and uh, drop in their ballot to him. And, and so this did, this was voted on. And my understanding is it passed unanimously uh, with our membership and it is now presented to you. And then the last one is letter I. And uh, I'd mentioned before, that Alex Fleming has been working as our um, HR director and as he's leaving to take on a new business. Um, 
I would like to have some transition days uh, for Bob Maver, who's going to be our new HR director. Um, as you saw earlier in, in these recommendations, we are posting for a middle school principal, um, and I would like him to lead that with um, uh, both uh, Amanda and Kathy to find that replacement. So I'm requesting 10 days for Bob. And I don't know how the, the board feels about letters um, A through I. If uh, you are comfortable combining them, I am as well. Any objection to that by anyone on the board? No. And um, I, I know uh, Bob's gonna do an awesome job and um, it, it sounds like one of his goals during that time is to have that uh, person uh, hired or at least uh, teed up. Yeah, he's excited about that. And I think it, what's nice is when, when you come in and you enter and you're leading a, um, a project like that in, in your a process, you get to sit down with fellow administrators, you get to sit down with parents, you get to sit down with teachers. And then when you, when you start to talk to people about what's important to them, I think that's really nice because then it can, it can shape the type of candidate that not only you're looking for now, but also as you do some process in the future. So I think it's a great way to come in and be able to do that even before you're officially on. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it and I know he is too. Is there a motion to approve superintendent's recommendations 5A through I? So moved. Seconded. Discussion? Uh, Dr. Goggin, as relates to the, uh, the, MOU, the MOU, I know it, it just goes through the end of this uh, school year. And I already know the answer to this question, but humor me. The, uh, we don't know what's gonna happen come August and September. Um, are you already starting to think and work with uh, Mr. McMorrow about what would um, a new MOU for uh, next school year start to look like? Um, I, it, we might be getting ahead of ourselves, but I'd hate for us all of a sudden at the last minute be like, oh, we need to craft another MOU. And although this one is a, is a good one, um, and it'll probably some good things to build upon it, but is that something that's, you know, maybe on the back burner? Because again, we, there's so many unknowns right now until August um, and a lot of it's out of our control, so. So I would say we haven't, we haven't sat down and said, okay, let's get started on our second MOU. Um, but what, if you do read through and you can see in certain sections that there are for, there is some foreshadowing into next year and, and there'll be specific carve outs that will say, you know, if the school building is closed, and, and primarily when you look at um, uh, compensation for supplemental contracts, you'll see it listed in there where it will mention that, you know, we understand that if there is um, a building closure or any type of cancellations due to COVID-19, then we will be looking at a prorated um, um, salary for those type of uh, sections. So while we've talked about those and, and we've we've gone through it, we haven't sat down and said, you know, let's get started on MOU number two. But it is non-precedent setting. And I think that's the other part <clears throat> to your point with it being so unknown going into next year, we, we kind of looked at this foreshadowing into next year, but also with a primary focus of what do we need to do now? What do we need to address right now uh, in our current situation so that people feel comfortable educating online and that we have our structure in place to do so. Thank you. You're welcome. Other discussion, further discussion? Well, the handbooks were very informative because I learned something new about the Swedish snus that I didn't know existed before. So there's always something with these kids. And I do appreciate the uh, diversions. Obviously, that those are big documents to kind of go through, and I appreciate that, um, Mrs. Maxwell. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that was something Kathy came <laughs> in when I said that. And, and actually, it's always good to track changes, and I think in the future that might just be a better thing for us to do. But I know that she converted uh, a PDF document into a Word document so she can edit that straight out. But um, I think in the future what we'll do is we'll track changes you guys with the train changes tracked on there because Kathy is, if you know Kathy, she is not only very talented, but she's incredibly hardworking. And she was, she was in the office yesterday 
um, highlighting those to, to get those changes to make sure you guys can see those. So thank you for that, Kathy. You're welcome. Uh, the, the handbooks were great. Uh, and my only comment, uh, Dr. Goggin, I sent you an email about, with a couple formatting and there was one uh, inconsistency in regarding to if you are only in school for partial of a day to be able to participate after school in Lee Burnison, you have two different times. One place it's 11 o'clock and another place it's 11.25. Okay, I will look at that again. Um, you know, I do ask the assistant principals to uh, check the content and I usually do the, the organization, uh, but I will double check that um, tomorrow. Okay, that was the only inconsistency I saw and it was only at Burnison. Westlake High School had it consistent in both spots. Okay. Further discussion? Roll call. Dole. Yes. Pernat. Yes. Fanukin. Yes. Kraft. Yes. Lazinski. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, thank you. And now on to board comments and board items. I have one question for Dr. Goggin. Um, does it look like there will be um, any rifts or teachers not being rehired uh, this year at all? Well, I think it depends. And, and, and my what I'm hoping is that if we have that, it's very minimal. One of the things we're really trying to do, and you saw the list of retirees um, earlier, and our goal is to um, um, get smaller via attrition. Now, the, the primary, and in saying that, the way we stand right now, so it with, uh, um, um, by the way, just to mention and, and uh, to, to compliment him in, in, in the meeting is uh, watching Mr. Hopkins' five-year forecast and the way he describes school finance, which is a very complex topic. He's very, very good at it and very thorough. And, and so being able to, and, and so as we've watched his presentation, you'll see that we, do, we are carrying over about $22 million in the bank over that. Um, we are in a decent financial position, but that will not last. Um, what we need to watch is, you know, if the state comes back and significantly reduces our finances, I may have to cut a little bit more. If there's an issue with our structure that will, will, will make it hard to carry the staff that I have, I would have to cut more. But as I'm sitting here today, um, I want to keep, I, I'm going to do everything I can to have all of our reductions be uh, happen through attrition. That's, that's my number one goal. And I think I could get in the ballpark of, of $300,000 with that. And so if I can do that and, and be very minimal to some of the uh, opportunities that some students have, that's my goal. If something comes back and says, well, you're losing another million and a half or this particular thing is happening, then I would have to go back to the drawing board. So, but as I sit here today, my, my goal is to, to make it uh, either very, very minimal or, um, um, or have that happen through attrition. It's just so hard to give you to say yes, 100%. Right, right, that, but, right. you know, based on the information I have right now, what does a good scientist say? You know what? I could be wrong, but based on the best information I have right now, the answer is going to be no. It's very sad right now where a lot of the colleges are cutting things. And I'm sure, um, Bob, you can, you can appreciate that. I mean, even they cut baseball at Bowling Green. So. Mm. That was amazing. I saw that. Now, no, and, and I, I know I'm not a board in, in for the comment, but I know that somebody just brought something up. Uh, I think Joe did a moment ago and talked yeah. about the potential of another meeting. And one of the things we have to do is we do need to approve our graduates and we need to approve our graduates. And the other thing, when I talked about summer programming, what's a little bit different with doing summer programming this year than in the past is we do need to write up a, uh, a plan. We need to su submit a plan to the Board of Health and have that approved. So what we're going to need to have happen to run our summer programming and also to run our graduation ceremony is for another board meeting in May to um, approve the graduates 
And also we would like to be ready to have you approve our summer plan for any summer programming that we're gonna run. So um, that is something and hopefully that doing it via Zoom makes it a little bit easier on everybody so we can have a nice quick meeting. Uh, but those are two things that, that we would like to, um, if, if, if you'd be willing to, I'd like to have another board meeting this month. Okay. That's good. Yeah, I'd right. like to, uh, I'd like to officially like to get my daughter out of high school. Yeah. <laughs> I, she would appreciate it. Yeah. So she can go to OU. Yes. That's right. That's where my daughter goes. That's why I have to say. Oh, Bob can't. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Bob. I'm excited to hear more about what's going on with the link program this summer. I know this is something that a lot of parents are very concerned about and have reached out to me regarding. So even just, you know, um, some basic cursory information saying that, you know, and I don't think most parent people really understand that the Board of Health, the County Board of Health is having to approve everything. Correct. And, and so two things that I'll say is that, um, number one, it's going to be smaller. We're not going to be able to, just telling you right up front, it, it will be something we won't be able to accommodate every family who's used to going to Camp Link. And number two, the pay structure is going to be different. You know, we're going to need uh, more staffing. We're going to need more cleaning. Um, so, you know, I know people are, are used to paying by the day or by the hour or, or this, and, and the costs will be different. And, you know, we need to figure out what, what are we going to need to charge for cleaning and cleaners, cleaning supplies, you know, more employees. So the price structure could potentially be different as well. And, and Mr. Hopkins has, has said, um, you know, in, in, in previous meetings that, you know, we're, we, we need to make sure that that link is is funding as it should. And, and you know, that can't be something we continuously take a loss in. Um, so we will look to run something very, very good, but also make sure that we're not continuing to drive that um, uh, deficit spending down even further to provide it. So those are two things we'll probably have less and we'll probably have a different cost structure to it as well. Would this be starting at the end uh, or in July, since I know there's the or state orders for no students in buildings until um, after June 30th, or would this be covering June also? Well, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant. My goal, if you were asking me what my goal is, my, my goal is to have it before uh, July. And, okay. um, you know, we do believe that we, we have some uh, leniency in running um, uh, the, the camp, uh, the summer camp. So we, we, we have been reviewing some documents and um, our goal is to have it before July, but if we review it again and find that we can't have it till July, we can't have it till July. But I, I, we're, our goal is to have it before that. Totally understand. And if there's any way, you know, even though I know there's still waiting on approval and a lot of things in motion, a way to start communicating, because I know a lot of parents are um, asking about that. And we know, and we know that. And Mike Waters, uh, he shared today during our meeting that you know the the uh, portal has been open to enroll. And, and even with knowing nothing, we have 40 people enrolled. So it's people, we, we know that people uh, look forward to it and they rely upon it. Um, and and, and we, we literally got the information on Thursday. Yeah. So it was, we, we got the information, the governor released information that was beneficial to us on Thursday. Um, I sat with uh, Dave Kosovar and Mike Waters this morning. Uh, we went through some different plans. So we are not wasting any time in getting this moving. And as soon as we also don't want to send information out that we have to take back. So what we want to do is make sure we get it right. And as quickly as we can get out accurate information, we will. Totally understand. And thank you for both you and Mr. Kosovar and Mr. Waters. I'm working through and finding options for the summer for a lot yeah. of our students. No child left outside. My favorite line of the day. Love that. Left inside. Inside. Left inside. inside. outside. You want him outside. <laughs> Dr. Goggin, yes. um, the uh, Lieutenant Governor Houston has recently created a little bit of uh, uncertainty as it relates to the school facilities. Yes. Uh, he's coming out now and saying that school facilities is where the kids congregate, but not necessarily, say, fields tracks, football field, baseball fields, and things like that, that they were supposedly never really closed. Um, so again, I, I, I'm not sure, but there is confusion out there. I know there was a number of Lorain County ADs uh, talking about it, concerned about it. And especially if the school build, if the school facilities can't open till the end of 
June. Uh, have you heard anything uh, as relates to say the facilities? And I'll just keep using yes. the baseball field as an example, because I know we're putting so much time and energy into that project, so. So um, yes, and so what's funny is, is, is Mr. Kosovar, Mr. Kosovar, Mr. Kosovar and I had three straight meetings. So we, we met with Mike Waters, we met with Tony Cipollone, and then we met with Stephanie Morgan. And, and focusing on, like I said, we just got information on Thursday and so we just booked it right away. And, and so we sat with um, Mike and went through Willink. We talked to Tony about athletics and we talked to Stephanie about extended school year. So when it, here's, the, here's the part and, and it is, and here's the tricky part when it comes to facilities. So if you reach out to the, the Cuyahoga Board of Health, which you have to do, you need to go in and, and say, here's our plan. We're going to uh, follow the um, governor's guidelines to say that groups of 10 or fewer. Um, we're going to talk to, we're, we're going to um, uh, post sign saying maintain social distancing, wear masks, or whatever it is, whatever the, the, the list that, that we need to follow, um, uh, we would follow. And they'll say, all that sounds great, but you also have to enforce it. So that's the part for us that makes it very challenging where I can open up my track and my football field and then say, everybody come on in and walk. And then if you have you know, kids out playing and they start, they're violating it, then what's expected of us as the owner and the host is that we're supposed to enforce those, not just post it, but if we're gonna open we have to enforce it. So we need more clarity on that too. So are they saying that to open the track and, and the stadium or the baseball fields or anything like that, I need to station a staff member there who's gonna watch it. And so if you have you know, kids and, and you take baseball, you know, so what if, what if somebody comes and plays baseball and they're not um, changing the ball as they're supposed to because you're supposed to have a ball for defense and then when the defense changes. You, so are we supposed to really enforce those things? And and, and then I'm going to turn to Todd again and say, Todd, I need to hire some people to go watch baseball games and watch, you know, people walk the track and that. So we're, we're trying to get that clarity. You know, one of the things we're putting in, putting together and what we'd love to be able to release is a Westlake reopening plan that would have Link in there. It would have our fields in there and it would have our ESY because, you know, uh, um, all the people who come and use our facilities through the summer are incredibly important. And we would like to be able to just send out and saying, okay, we have all of our information. If you're going to use the fields, this is what you do. You're going to utilize ESY. This is what's happening. And, when, and if you're going to be a part of Project Link, here's the information. So we, we're, we're trying to hammer those things out. We do have guidance um, for that, John. And it's the exact thing you're talking about with the mixed message to where they're like, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You could do it. And then that's what he, people hear on the news. And then when you call for some clarity, they say, well, yes, but you realize you need to enforce that. And I think that's the part that we're, we're trying to get our arms around. Yeah, le other... leaving things, I was gonna say, leaving things up to each individual county public health is gonna be very confusing over the next number of months. And I think it's gonna be inconsistent. And, and, yes. and so one of the, so here's what's gonna be interesting about that. And Liz and, actually, Liz and I actually talked about this a little bit today is um, even we border some Lorain County schools. And, and, and Lorain County communities. So what very easily could happen is, you know, you can have uh, the Lorain County Board of Health approve things that the Cuyahoga County Board of Health doesn't. And then, so then you're going to get people saying, well, how come, you know, these particular communities can do this and we can't? And, and so, you know, I, I but I agree in, 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 in the concept is to, to, to have that sense of local control, which is something we like, you know, we like uh, instead of always having to go to the state to be able to go to uh, on the lower level in and within our county is much more beneficial to us, but it also can create those inconsistencies. So thank you. Liz, do you have something? Yeah, and on the same side, when you go to enforce, if we're supposed to enforce the field and social distancing and what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do, the reality is, and this is the same thing that they're having going on in the restaurants and bars that have reopening, yeah, you can say whatever you want. If they're not going to listen, I mean, I live behind next to Westlake High School. We go for a walk and there's kids over there. And when I over, you know, and they're inside the field, that's locked up and they hop the fence and you say, hey, guys, the field's closed. Get out of here. They give you the middle finger and tell you to go away. 
Well, but that's I think the reality. Yeah, the difference that you have that one of the differences that you have is that when we there's a difference between somebody jumping a fence. Like we we had issues where where kids would um, slide the um, the bike rack, you know, uh, close enough to be able to climb it and jump over the fence. They're making a conscious effort to break our rules. And and so, but the difference, and and I totally hear what you're saying because it, it's it's back to the point where when you look at the enforcement part of it. But I think what they're saying is, if you open your gates, if you unlock those gates and slide them open and, and, and have them open and, and say, yeah, come on in, you can use our facilities, then you got to make sure it's safe. And, and so I think there's a little bit less on us to, um, not that when we see it, we don't acknowledge it and do it, but less for me to station somebody there and make sure that a closed facility is being used right, so. Correct, and if we do open the gates and if we are supposed to have a staff member there enforcing it, and they proceed to not follow the rules that are being set forward, what's then the consequences? That's what, uh, you know, is- They would need to be removed and they would have to follow. They would would have to follow it is what they would have to do. What I would hate to see is somebody have to forcibly remove someone. No, and and we wouldn't get into that. I wouldn't ask, I would never ask a staff member to do that. And, and, um, but I totally get your point. And I think that's, it's it's back to our point, how, our concern primarily, like I stated from the beginning, is the enforcement piece. And it's not like something where you can open it up and say that you need to self-enforce because you could be dealing with kids and you can have a, a, you know, 10, 12 year old kid say, I didn't know, you know, and nobody told me, I didn't see the sign. So I guess there, and and we need more clarity on um, what our level enforcement is. And, And so while we did get some information, as John mentioned before, um, some of it, I wouldn't call it contra- contradictory, you know, and, and made it a little bit confusing um, in how we interpret that. Uh, but I, I suspect we'll be getting more guidance soon. Dr. So Gaga, how yeah. would uh, ROs be engaged uh, with enforcement if that's uh, decided? Well, they're, they are primarily during the school year. And, and we have a contract with them to uh, their work days are our school days. And, and while they're available to us now, the reason they're available even during um, uh, the building closures, um, it's because they are contracted to be a part of us right now. So, but in the summer is probably not so much. But I, I think about now, if you hypothetically developed a plan, presented it to the county and opened up, I don't know, a track and a field and um, tennis courts. It's right next to city hall. The police station's right there. Um, I'm not asking for an answer now, but it, sure. it seems like it'd be a logical uh, conclusion. Uh, they're contracted. Um, could could they enforce? I know we've all heard the stories about um, whether it's public square or the uh, open space next to um, West Side Market, and you have 20 people gathering, hanging around. Squad car pulls up and says, "You got to get out," and you know they immediately immediately disperse. I don't know if something like that's possible or not. Yeah, I think so, what we're going to have to do, and 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 believe me, you know, Chief B. Lozer is is like um, uh, he is he is very supportive in, in everything we're doing, and so is the the mayor and council, and and you know, so I'm I'm sure that when we need them, they'll, they'll contribute. But and I but I guess in, in just kind of thinking through it. I'm wondering if if we were able to um, be open but not open for as long of a time, we'd have to have we'd have to have scheduled hours to be open, you know, in in order to have so if if it stays as put, you know, if if the things change a little bit and we get a little more flexibility with what we're expected to do in regard to enforcement, um, so we may start with we may start with certain you know hours of operation for tennis courts and tracks and 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 see, right. but I, and that might not be horrific because I would be willing to bet if we monitored it, we'd be able to target times where it is more heavily utilized or populated. Um, so we, we just got to figure that out. It's just, an, like I said, it, it's just another thing where it's not as simple anymore of saying, unlock your gates and let people right. go. There, right. Every single step we've had to take has, has another layer of uh, planning that's attached to it, which, you know, it's just sign for the times and we'll do it. You, along with your staff, is, have been very thoughtful and hardworking, and um, I, I think one of the reasons we're, we're spending time on this today and so much time is that we do hear that from our residents, hey, I want to get the heck out of the house. I, I want to do something. There's that uh, those tennis courts there. I can social distance with tennis. I can 
run around the track. I need to do something. And, and you, you get those calls as well. So thank you for all yes. your heart. Um, if, Has he said anything about the track being closed? Because that was open to the citizens before and a lot of people utilized the track, walking around the track and city. We have, had, we have not had a conversation with the city about the track at this point, because I think it really, and, and really I think the, the date, if I have the date right, um, you know, a lot of a lot of things are, especially when you talk about fields, May 26th is a date. I think that that is established for some of these. So, um, you know, we 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 do we are trying to get um, a plan in place to get this rolling. Just to let just to let you know, while we were been in the meeting, I just got a message from somebody saying okay. that Wesley. I have one more question for you about. Um, And Barbie, keep breaking up, but uh, go ahead if you can. Yeah. Um, though the city was going to talk about um, turfing Reed Field. Have you heard anything more about that? I think with with um, the and and uh, with the state freezing budgets and looking at twenty percent reductions, um, I do believe the the you know, I won't speak for the city, but my understanding is that a project like that would probably be put on hold oh, as they, okay. you know, kind of looking at, um, sure. you know, making sure their budgets are good. Um, Liz, you had something you said yeah. while we're here. Uh, since we're talking about the fields, I just got a message from someone saying that Westlake baseball and softball has been canceled for the summer. Okay. Well, and I'll tell you what, that's that's been happening in other communities as well. And one of the issues that I, I that doesn't surprise me at all. It's disappointing because I, I can't having not having baseball and as a former softball coach, um, it, it just kills me, you know, to see Nazi baseball and softball going. But one of the things that these uh, little league organizations are dealing with, and it's my understanding, is that they they when somebody rents our facilities, they need to have um, an insurance policy. And, um, and all of them carry that. However, and, and I'm not an expert in insurance, but one of the things that I've heard, so someone can fact check me and I could be wrong, but one of the things that I had heard is that um, that particular policy does not cover COVID related issues. And, and they, an, an additional rider would have to be purchased uh, for that as well. And I don't think it's, it's very inexpensive. And so I think there's a lot of hurdles for our youth um, baseball and softball organizations to try and um, get across uh, in order to have their seasons. And, and, and unfortunately, I think you're going to see that in many, many communities where that uh, youth baseball and softball is not going to happen. Oh, I agree. If I may, I just had a, a few things I wanted to share. Uh, thanks to uh, really all of my fellow uh, board members. I know uh, the community is reaching out to you a lot and uh, thanks for continuing to listen and uh, to really um, uh, be there uh, for the citizens and also be there for the district. Um, I think about two, uh, Mr. Hopkins, Dr. Goggin and Kathy Maxwell, very involved in the uh, establishment of the Westlake Educational Foundation. Uh, thank you for being a part of that, uh, getting it started, and thank you for continuing to be a, a part of it as well. Um, Scott, uh, Dr. Goggin touched on it already. Uh, Todd, you really make uh, finances, uh, uh, you communicate very well. Uh, we appreciate all that you do, uh, so I wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I have a uh, thank you note from uh, Meals on Wheels. Uh, you're all familiar with the organization, but along with running a, a district uh, with uh, distance learning. Uh, Dr. Goggin uh, reached out to the community in many ways. Uh, one of those ways was to assist with Meals and, uh, on Wheels and their mission. So I thank you, Dr. Goggin, for that. One final thing, uh, just a, uh, a good story, a fun story. Many times we're reached out. Uh, we have the community reach out to us and had a, a great experience uh, just this week where uh, one of our students who happens to be on the autism spectrum, um, I was able to connect him with one of our graduates who's on the autism spectrum uh, for a conversation about life coaches. And uh, it was a, a growth experience for both of those individuals, the mentor as well as the mentee. And in that relationship, super cool. Uh, both of those entities, the mentor and the mentee, uh, both benefit from that. And I wanted to share that with you. 
Thanks. Anything else? Are there any other board items or discussion? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call. To adjourn at 7.31 p.m. Piernot? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Kraft? Yes. Lazinski? Lazinski? Yes. And Stoll? Yes. I said yes. 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 Motion carries. Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night. everyone. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.